Joining me for this special current events episode is Sal Mercagliano. Sal and I go way back, kind of, a, a couple of years ago when I was hosting the Proceedings Podcast at the Naval Institute, and we had Sal on that program to talk about uh, the Merchant Marine and sort of how it looks when it's facing the China problem. But now Sal has been wading into this Houthi situation, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, particularly he deals with it from the commercial shipping aspect, but of late, our Venn diagrams, as it were, have overlapped. So I thought it was past time to have Sal on the channel to provide some analysis of what's going on in that region. But Sal, first, give us your bio. Sure. So uh, a graduate of the State University of New York Maritime College. So I worked as a merchant mariner. I sailed for three years with the Military Sealift Command, worked ashore for them for four years, then I went off on an academic route, got an MA in maritime history from East Carolina U University, a PhD in military and naval history from the University of Alabama. And really my study had been looking at the interaction between commercial and uh, military uh, applications, particularly sea lift. But really since roughly the mid 2010s, I've been talking about commercial industry policy and I started a YouTube channel, What's Going On With Shipping, uh, where I talk about this uh, largely after the Ever Given got uh, sideways in the Suez back in March of 2021. You and I are both old enough to remember way back when, when the Houthis fired some Quds missiles apparently towards Israel. And that was the first time, it seems like a long time ago now, <laughs> that we were talking about the USS Kearney an Arleigh Burke class destroyer in the Red Sea, shooting down uh, the the weapons that that the Houthis had fired towards Israel. So we all thought, okay, it looks like the Houthis have joined in on this war that's emerging, and they're trying to spread the war. This is one of those Iranian proxies on the Arabian Peninsula. We knew that the Houthis had a history both with the Saudis, but also with the U.S. Navy. In that, a couple of years ago, they fired. Cuds missiles at Mason and another small boy. Fortunately, Mason was uh, was at Operation Condition Three and was able to knock those weapons down. But as I said on one of my episodes recently, after talking to a guy who was a CEO of an Arleigh Burke class, he reminded me that we're not new to this AOR, either the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden or the North Arabian Sea or the Persian Gulf for that matter, particularly the small boys. And we'll talk about the tanker wars and the analog for what's going on now. But let me start, Sal, by reading a US 9 news item from this morning that deals with this new thing called Operation Prosperity Guardian. So let me let me read this item real quick as a as a sort of scene setter. This is written by our good friend Sam Legrone at US and I News, another publication or another media outlet that I recommend you guys subscribe to. They do a daily newsletter that is full of gouge each and every weekday morning. So Sam writes, the Pentagon on Monday announced an initiative to protect commercial traffic in the region after almost two months of attacks on merchant ships in the Red Sea by forces in Yemen. It's called Operation Prosperity Guardian, and that's a multinational push to ensure freedom of navigation in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, under the structure of the existing Combined Task Force 153, according to a statement from Secretary of Defense Austin. Quote, countries that seek to uphold the foundational principle of freedom and navigation must come together to tackle the challenge posed by this non-state actor, launching ballistics missiles and uncrewed aerial vehicles at merchant vessels from many nations lawfully transiting international waters. End quote. CTF, which is Combined Task Force 153, is an existing group that's run by the Bahrain-based Combined Maritime Forces Partnership and tasked with Red Sea security. The CTF was established last year and has been commanded by both U.S. and Egyptian naval forces. According to the participants, include the United Kingdom, Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles, and Spain to jointly address security challenges in the Southern Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. As of Monday, details on what ships will be involved in the force were not available, a Pentagon spokesman told US9 News. US Navy has at least three destroyers in the vicinity of the Bob El Mandeb Strait between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Kearney, Mason, and Thomas Hudner, all ships we have talked about in great detail in recent weeks. They've all operated in the region. 
UK Royal Navy guided missile destroyer Diamond, French Navy guided missile frigate Languedoc, I probably mangled that. I was told there would be no French, have operated in the Red Sea as well. All the ships have intercepted and destroyed weapons launched from Yemen toward ships in the Red Sea. These weapons include guided cruise missiles, short range ballistic missiles, and scores of Iranian built Shahid Delta wing drones, the suicide drones. Just Saturday, Carney shot down 14 drones, and we'll talk about some deep intel on what they used to shoot down those 14 drones and the cost effectiveness therein. So they shot down 14 drones launched from Houthi controlled areas of Yemen that were headed towards a commercial ship. Uh, Houthi forces in Yemen claimed attacks on two merchant ships in the Red Sea, the MV Swan Atlantic and the MSC Clara. Since October 17th, the Houthis have attacked ships moving near the maritime choke point at the Bab al Mandeb, at first linked to Israel or Israeli interests. Uh, again, something we've documented on the channel. The first ship that they attacked was an Israeli owned, I believe, Panamanian flagged. Uh, a cargo ship uh, or a container ship, and then uh, sailing to and from Israel. So that, uh, as I said at the outset, Sal, that made sense to us. Uh, and now the aperture is opened to more, let's just say, indiscriminate. The Iran-backed Houthis are connected to the attacks to the ongoing conflict in southern Israel between Hamas and the Israeli Defense Forces. The Houthi military leader Yusuf al-Mandani said any escalation in Gaza is an escalation in the Red Sea, and any calm in Gaza is considered calm in the Red Sea. Any country or party that comes between us and Palestine, we will confront it. As a result, more and more merchant ships are avoiding the Red Sea. Again, this is your detail that we'll, we'll dive deep on. And time-saving Suez Canal route to Europe and instead taking a detour, several thousand mile, I think it, it amounts to somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 mile detour around the southern tip of Africa. Among the shipping companies that are avoiding the Red Sea are the oil company BP and container shippers Haypag, Lloyd, and Maersk. Ahead of the creation of Prosperity Guardian, both Pentagon and White House have downplayed the attacks in the Red Sea as not directly targeting U.S. forces in the region. Pentagon officials have not acknowledged that the U.S. military would make a commiserate response on target in Yemen as a result of the ongoing drone and missile launches. Um, so Sabrina Singh, uh, who we feature on the channel, said, we're not in an armed conflict with the Houthis. Um, okay. We have seen drones and missiles shot from Houthi-controlled areas within Yemen. Not necessarily targeting our ships, but of course, targeting most likely commercial vessels that are transiting through the Red Sea. Uh, might be a distinction without a difference, but we'll discuss. And then the last element, Sal, is over the weekend, and this is a big one, the U.S. moved the carrier Eisenhower and its escorts to the Gulf of Aden from the uh, the Persian Gulf. So this strikes me as a big deal. Um, ship spotters also saw the guided missile destroyer Laboon, another Arleigh Burke class, DAG-58, enter the Red Sea from the Suez Canal on Monday. All right, a lot to unpack there. Um, so what's the first thing that comes to mind in, in the in the wake of that breaking news, as it were? And number one, the, the Houthi have just escalated this to a point where it's indiscriminate attacks against shipping. You know, whatever guys they had that they were attacking ships connected to Israel and heading to Israel, that's gone. We've seen strikes on ships, Maersk Gibraltar, number nine. I, I mean, they're hitting ships just what they want to hit. So that has really created the issue of increased war risk insurance going through this region. You know, one of the things that shippers have had to do is pay more to go through this region. And normal war risk, which you were paying for, was about 0.02% of the value of the ship. Now, all of a sudden, it's jumped. It's jumped up to about a half a percent to 0.7 of a percent. And now you're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to go through there. And for a lot of the big commercial shipping firms and the two ones that started it was Maersk and Hop Hog, they both basically said, listen, we are not getting the protection we need. We are traveling through this area. The insurance is going to go up and the potential for damage is such that we're going to pull the ships out. And they did. And once they did that, that started the wave effect here of everybody else following along with them. And it basically triggered the United States and its allies to take action. 
Uh, if you listen to one of the earlier DOD briefings on this, they basically said, we're going to let the sh commercial companies figure this out. It's, it's, you know, it's small scale. It doesn't seem to be too big. Yet you had ships like Al Jazeera, for example, that was hit by a ballistic missile. The first time I know of that we've seen a ship hit by a ballistic missile. And so the shipping companies have decided, okay, we're going to detour. And understand, this is going to have repercussions across the entire global supply chain. The minute you start pulling those ships out of their schedule, it's a domino effect. It's changing one box in your Excel spreadsheet, and all of a sudden, everything changes. And what happens now is how do you respond to that? How does the U.S. respond to it? As you mentioned, we've had CTF-153 up and running in the Red Sea for two years, but it's been a pretty low level command. It's commanded by Desron 50, Destroyer Squadron 50. It really hasn't gotten the big visibility of some other entities. And now all of a sudden you've got to elevate this up. You've got to create a combined task force. You've got to bring in a lot of forces in. And there's a big question about how do you do this? You mentioned uh, Ernest Will and the uh, escorting of tankers out of Iran and Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s. That was fairly small scale. The number of tankers that the Kuwaitis reflagged were about a dozen or two. And so all the U.S. had to do was take a couple of ships at a time through the Persian Gulf and get them out. And even know, you and I both know that wasn't easy. We had ships that encountered hits, uh, commercial and naval vessels. So it was a lot to escort out. In the 2000s, 2010s, we had CTF-151 operating in the Gulf of Aden against piracy but you're operating against skiffs with pirates on board with AK-47s and RPGs. The Houthi are a whole other level. And the amount of ships you have going through the Bab el-Mandeb on a normal day is anywhere between 50 to 70. It's going through here, 12% of the world trade. And now you've got to figure out a way, okay, how do we do this? How do we do this escorting? Are we going to do it uh, AK, you know, a la Tom Hanks and Greyhound? Are we going to put big convoys th through, surround them with escorts, and fight them through back and forth? Are we going to set up picket stations, You know, set up a, a number of ships between the main shipping line and Yemen and catch the missiles as they come back? Or again, things we haven't talked about and really the, the, the administration doesn't want to talk about is hitting the sites in Yemen and neutralizing them before they can be launched or worst case scenario, you know, taking the Bataan amphibious ready group and putting Marines on the ground to make sure that this doesn't happen. You said 50 to 70 a day, right? And, and so as we talk about the Greyhound scenario, the question arises, do we have the ships to support that over time? There's some issue as to whether we have uh, enough ships to do that and whether we can, you know, carry that out for an extended period of time and the the cost of doing that uh, to the Pentagon and there, thereby the American taxpayer. So just I'll give you one example. And I heard this last night um, at a, a holiday party with some friends of ours uh, who who had been in recent conversations with some Pentagon officials that will go unnamed but what the Pentagon never says lately when they document these shootdowns is what weapon are they using? And as I've sort of laid out before, in terms of kinetic weapons, we basically have three choices when you're talking Arleigh Burke class. So you've got uh, standard missiles, you've got five inch guns, and you've got Sea Whiz. In the case of Saturday's shoot down of 14 drones, a drone swarm by Carney, what this Pentagon official told, let's just call it my source, was they used 18 standard missiles to shoot down 14 drones. Okay, so they got them all, but do the math, Sal. Those Shahid drones cost about $20,000 each. A standard missile, if you're talking about an SM-2 of you know the the redesigned SM2s cost about 2.5 million dollars each. And so that's not cost effective. It is effective in terms of the results. So this is kind of like using a JDAM in Iraq to take out a pickup truck. You know, we did that for basically 20 years, right? So the other question is and we spoke to this on a previous episode on my channel about 
Okay, what is the weapons inventory on your average Arleigh Burke? So it's 94X. And then the question is, how many cruise missiles, how many Tomahawks are loaded? And whatever you, whatever the balance of that is, you can fill with SM2s. And I believe you can put four SM2s in every VLS tube. Um, and, and so my understanding is Carney has already rearmed once since October 7th. Um, and, and so, you know, again, if we're talking about 24-7 coverage, a la Greyhound, a la North Atlantic convoy escorts, not just reflagging, but convoy escorts, where even a single weapon getting through is one too many, that's a lot of coverage. Okay, so um, let's talk about cost to the consumer specifically, because maybe already the people listening are like, it's, this is just an abstract to me. Um, just like you did with Ever Given, you pointed out that that container ship stuck in the Suez is affecting world markets this number of dollars per day. Further, if you're wondering why your BMW hubcaps haven't reached your dealer or your lawn chairs for summer season aren't in Home Depot yet, here's what's up. So I think most people don't realize how the stuff they get gets to them and what the resident effects. So when you talk about Maersk is saying, we're not going through there anymore. We're going to take, you know, go around South Africa. They bear an expense. You talk about the increased insurance. All that is passed on to the consumer, right? The, the, the company isn't going to pay for that ultimately. So what are the resident effects of this over time if we do not do something that deters the Houthi significantly? So, you know, we love to talk about maritime choke points. And right now, maritime choke points are the thing that are clogging up the global supply chain. You have the Panama Canal that's at low water levels. Right now, you're getting about two thirds of the number of ships going through. So two of the biggest container alliances, these are groups of container ship companies, have decided instead of sending their ships through the Panama Canal from the Asia to the East Coast and Gulf Coast, we'll send them through the Suez Canal because that route is, is a little bit longer. But it's efficient. Well, now you've got the blockage. Now you've got the Houthi that are attacking ships. And now all the major container liners are rerouting the ships. So as you mentioned, it's about 3,500 extra nautical mile round, you know, to get around Africa. It's about anywhere from seven to 14 days for a commercial ship. But what you have is a almost a domino effect, a butterfly effect here down the entire supply chain. Because those ships that were coming from Asia to Europe, and again, this is the most densely packed supply route on the planet in terms of shipping. They're scheduled to pull into a port. At that port, they're going to transload that cargo to other ships. That cargo is going to go on rail. It's going to go on buses. It's going to go on trucks, on air. All those schedules are out the window now. They're gone. And now what you're going to see is an issue here where the container companies are not going to get maybe four or five you know, round trips a year from their ship. They may only get three or four. And which that means now is you've got to prioritize your cargo. If you want to get your cargo on a ship, you're going to have to pay more to do it. We're going to have to break out another ship to pick up that route and do it. And I haven't even started talking about fuel yet because now all of a sudden you have the big oil companies jumping in. We're heading into winter in Europe. Europe has cut itself off from Russian oil. It's getting its oil from either the United States or from the Middle East. Well, now that Middle East oil has to go the same way it did when the Suez closed in 1967 to 1975. And by the way, we don't have extra tankers lying around because tankers haven't been built because tanker market hasn't been flux with money like the way the container ship market was. So now all of a sudden, tankers have to go. We may move some more cargo by air. The problem is aviation fuel is at a premium right now, really tough to get. And now all of a sudden it's going to be even harder to move because we don't have enough tankers to move it around. And the one benefits, let's talk about benefits here. Who benefits from all this? Uh, the Russians benefit from this immensely because their tankers, the dark fleet, the one that is moving Russian oil, they're still going through the Bab el Mandab. They're still going through the Suez. Uh, traffic hasn't stopped going through there. Ships are still going through, but some companies have stopped. But Russian oil, which is boycotted in, in, in Europe, for example, is going to India, it's going to the Middle East, it's going to China, it's being refined, either consumed there or then exported to other places. And so this situation, you know, I, I, I love the Carney. Carney, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a small boy guy. I love the destroyers. They're great. 
But one of the things that the Houthi have been able to do is while they haven't been able to penetrate through Carney and, and through that missile shield, one of the things that they have done is change the course of trade on the ocean. In many ways, have the Houthi demonstrated a method of sea power that maybe some of the biggest sea powers in the world have never been able to do is cause trade to change its course and therefore impact global economics on a scale we really haven't seen yet. I don't think we know how significant this is because even if we resume trade tomorrow, the impact is going to be felt because we have created that kind of wave effect. Whenever given went sideways, it closed the Suez for six days. This has been going on for more than six days. And we're going to see this really impact throughout the entire supply chain. And again, I'm not sure how you fix this because right now you have ships piling up in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Oman. Not all the ships have turned around. So for example, you have six US flagged Maersk uh, American car carrier and Waterman ships sitting there waiting to go through the straits. But Maersk has come out, and, and my contacts have talked about this, that Maersk has come out and said, listen, we don't want just an escort for those ships. We want escort for all our ships. So if you don't escort all our ships, it's going to be a problem. So I, I'm not sure how big this gets. This is potential global economic crisis. Um, that's not overstating it, especially when you add on the fuel crisis piece. And like you also said, auto you know, carriers and finite number of ships prioritizing their loads. So again, I'm suggesting that if the average consumer who happens to be watching this channel uh, isn't feeling like this affects them, they're dead wrong. They're very wrong. Gas shortages kind of a thing. And you might not get that car that you ordered on time at least, and you might pay a significant greater amount for it, you know, going forward. As you phrased it, Sal, what hit me, you talk about the Houthis have been successful in rerouting shipping. So I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure that's why we have a Navy, is to keep shipping routes open, free trade. And so this is definitive in terms of how do we fix this. Further, currently, the cause for the chaos is singular in terms of the bad actor, which is the Houthis. So I think what we're going to see is we will ramp up the pressure on the Houthis. We'll also urge, particularly the Egyptians, to do what they can do to ramp up Arab to Arab state pressure, although the Houthis aren't a state, right? This is a non-state actor. But certainly they can bring some... Uh, pressure to bear that that maybe an infidel nation cannot. Uh, and the Egyptians care because of the economics piece, right? So check me on this. It costs a ship $500,000 to transit the Suez. I think Navy ships pay a, a million dollars, but like an aircraft carrier pays a million dollars, but it costs anybody else $500,000 to transit the Suez. Is that a, an accurate number? About average. I mean, of course, it, it depends on the size of the vessel, but you know, the, Egypt generates about nine billion dollars in toll money over the year uh, annually from that. So far, as you have mentioned on your channel, the number of ships diverting is relatively small and growing. But I think the Houthis, not to get in their head, are trying to create. A circumstance where nobody goes through the Bob El Mandeb Strait. And I'm not sure to what end, except that thing that was in Sam's article there, where they're like, you know, if the Gazans, the Palestinians are, you know, under fire, we consider ourselves under fire. If the Palestinians are starving, we're going to make sure that world markets are affected and potentially, you know, rich nations feel the, the brunt of of not getting goods and services and food even, right? And so that's their kind of thesis. That's their bumper sticker. I think what we're about to see is whatever this Operation Prosperity Guardian is, and it's not quite clear, is it a reflagging effort? Is it escorts? Did Ike move to execute a contingency op that I guarantee you they already have in the books of attacking Sanaa or wherever? And of those other options, you mentioned the ARG doing, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a, a marine op. 
I don't think that would happen. That would be like the third or fourth option. I think what you'd see before then, a whole bunch of cruise missiles coming off of subs and small boys into the target set, whatever they have in terms of an integrated air defense, um, that one F-5 they have that they did that video today that they showed the F-5 flying by the parade. Good luck to that guy if he decides to turn south. I don't even think that airplane has a radar. Talk about alone and unafraid. That That's the definition right there. That guy wouldn't last very long. That would be part A. And then part B would be integrated airstrikes, starting with soft kills, hard kills of whatever SAMs are left uh, by growlers, shooting harms and doing uh, jamming. And then, you know, now we got Super Hornets dropping JDAM and GBUs and whatever dumb bombs are required to take out troops in the open or whatever. I think based on the way you framed it, uh, in terms of the effects on the global economy, uh, we have no choice really, but to do something more substantial than than just uh, shoot down missiles as they come at us. As we used to say in the Tomcat, in the early days when we were talking about Phoenix missiles against AS4s coming off bears and badgers was shoot Indians, not arrows. Meaning shoot down the bear, don't shoot down the AS4s as they come off. Right, So that's the same circumstance we have now, which is kind of what the Israelis did with the rockets. It's like, shoot the launchers, blow up the launchers, not each rocket with Iron Dome, because we're running out of Iron Dome munitions. And so that's kind of what we have before us. Let's get rid of their CUDS launching facilities, their drone launching facilities. I think that Ike moving out of the Gulf back into the North Arabian Sea uh, is a significant uh move on the chessboard here. The other big player in this is going to be the shipping lines. Uh, and, and what do they want as a result? You know, what is going to make them comfortable to be able to sail the ships through? I think those discussions are going on right now. I know in DC that the American versions of the shipping lines are meeting with officials right now. But the problem is going to be these shipping lines are international. And what is going to be enough to give them the comfort that they're going to be able to sail through that area without a problem? Right now, even the U.S. flag versions of those ships are not going through. Uh, they're not sending them through because there's not comfort enough to go through at this point. So I think that's a big player we have to look at of the shipping lines. The other element is you're right about the proxy players. You know, one of the things that's been under, under the kind of the radar here is a ship got hijacked. Uh, and a lot of people are associating that with Somali piracy right now. The Ruren, which is a Bulgarian owned Maltese flag vessel is right off the coast of Somalia right now. Somali piracy has been dead since 2017. Now all of a sudden it makes its appearance this seems much more like another element of what the Houthi are trying to do to bring in here. While there's Somalis doing this, are they working for the Houthi? The, the, the ones that were grabbed by the Mason coming off the tanker of the Central Park were Somalis, but they were heading to Yemen. And I also have to think right now, if, if you're Iran, if you're Russia, you're China, you're watching this and you got to be sitting there going, man, the Houthis have disrupted global trade with a handful of drones, ballistic missiles, and some cruise missiles. Uh, if you're the Iran Ar Iranian sitting at the Straits of Hormuz, you're sitting there going, ah, this is gold. We can do this to global fuel. If you're the, uh, if you're the Chinese in the Taiwan Strait or in the islands in the South China Sea, you're looking at this as like, not only can we disrupt it, but will these commercial firms come to the aid of these other countries? Will they risk their vessels because right now they're seen pretty much, you know, risk adverse at this moment. Are they going to take this and come, you know, because a lot of war plans have this idea that these ships will come, you know, if you if we have the war, they'll show up. And if they don't show up, that's going to throw off a lot of a lot of plans that are in the books right now for global shipping. And and, and again, I, I think what the Houthi are demonstrating to us and much like the Ukrainians demonstrated in the Black Sea is how a, a force without a Navy largely can defeat a Navy or at least push it back. And right now you're seeing that reaction take place. I think you're right about the Egyptians. I think the Egyptians have a role to play in this. But you know, this is a scenario that we really not gamed out before. We knew about the Houthis, everybody realized this, but their position astride that choke point has really demonstrated what it takes to be able to be a world player all of a sudden. And you know, more people are talking about Houthi in Yemen than ever before.
Yeah, it seems like they're begging for a reaction. And that's the other thing that concerns me as I talk about the Iranian influence, the Iranian uh, proxy piece is what else is going on here where they're like, you know, being so provocative? Because as you frame it, in terms of the lessons that we'll demonstrate to Russia and China particularly, uh, it strikes me that our reaction needs to be deliberate and unflinching. And when I hear Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh say, uh, well, you know, they haven't attacked us yet. Like I said, when I was reading Sam's article, that's, that's a difference without a distinction. Then my other question is, so what's it going to take for us to then change that logic to the degree that we do reflag tankers and we do ensure that these sea lanes are not disrupted at all, which again, strikes me as that's why John Barry and Stephen Decatur kind of sailed over the horizon the first time was to make sure that sea lanes were open globally. That's why you pay for a Navy. You know, that's why we have these ships and we're a major power that can go over the horizon and stay over the horizon. We have task forces that don't ever come home. China can't do that. Russia can barely do that these days, if at all. We're the only one that can do that at length. So here's the real test to our U.S. Navy. And it's going to be interesting to see how we react. And I, I hope that we react again with unflinching resolve here because of all the reasons you lay out. You know, you're hitting on a big point there that really I, I want to hit home is, you know, when we talk about John Barry, Stephen Decatur and those great, you know, you, you talk about the Navy being founded by piracy in many ways, the Naval Act of 1794, the historian in me comes out, you know, that's the whole reason for the founding of the Navy. But this situation is, is a lot different because those ships that are being diverted and hung up right now, the vast majority of them are flagged in the Marshall Islands, Panama and Liberia. It's, it's you know, they, they're, you know, one of the things we've done post World War II was create these open registries that have lowered the operating costs so that we can see global trade increase. You know, the, the, the cost to move goods has decreased, you know, demonstrably over those decades. But one of the reasons that those shipping costs are so low is because Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands aren't sending their navies because they don't have any because those taxes are low. Should the U.S. Navy adopt the role of really being the policeman of the oceans and the guardian of the oceans and freedom of the seas, you know, where does our role take over and where, you know, where's the allies, that list of 10 nations that you listed sounds great, but I didn't hear, you know, a lot of the big nations that are, have a big interest in this. Where's Japan? Where's Korea? You know, the Chinese 45th escort group is sitting there off Djibouti right now watching this whole thing unfold, they don't seem to be playing a big role in this whatsoever. And again, they may be playing a role behind the scenes, I think, and watching this and documenting it. But you know, this is an international aspect. I think that's the other element here that we really need to be careful about is not making this the US response and making it like we saw with combined task force 151 this is allied we had the indians we had we had you know tons of nations involved uh the ship that's being held right now by the houthi is a japanese ship you know what's japan's role in this we we've seen them change their constitution so this is this is a threat to international trade and i think we really have to be sure that we're careful not to do a unilateral response we what we really want is that unified response very you know operation desert storm type you know this should be something along those lines because i think that's also what our, iran is looking at look it's the americans acting like you know, the superpower. Uh, and, and so I think that's the other thing we got to be extremely careful about in this situation. Yeah, that's a good point. However, we all know that it needs to be US led uh, because of the capabilities piece. And when you're talking about, uh, you, know, you know, how Panama and the other Liberia don't have navies, this is the unintended consequence of cheap goods and fulfillment the way that the American consumer particularly expects it. You know, again, as you pointed out with Ever Given, people don't know where their stuff comes from or how it gets to them. You know, it's just like it's on the shelf there of my local, you know, mega chain. And I think until we get a little more savvy on that, uh, we will be prey for these sorts of interruptions. And then the demand signal to do something about it won't come from Liberia. It will come from constituents of American lawmakers 
who have their daily lives interrupted because of what's happening to shipping currently in the Bab El Mandeb and Gulf of Aden and Red Sea. So Sal Mercagliano, the OG from the merchant marine and shipping space. It's good to see you again. We'll have you on the channel again very soon. Again, I recommend you subscribe to Sal's YouTube channel, What's Going On With Shipping, for all the latest on what is in fact going on with shipping and many more things. So thank you for your expertise today. Ward, thank you for having me on the channel and congratulations on your success, sir. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.